Let's break some rules for once. I'm always telling you about the rules. But I mean, come on, we're supposed to be focusing on the Romantic period, when people wanted to show off their individuality. And in that context, the whole purpose of the rules is to show how clever you are at breaking them. Welcome to my music tutorials for people who enjoy good music and want to understand it better. I've been showing you how to compose a Romantic symphony, the tutorial symphony in four Romantic styles, where each movement has a different musical slant. We've reached the final movement. Everyone knows Russian music, and especially Tchaikovsky. Late Romantic, high drama, extremely tuneful, colorful orchestration. Well, I'm not Tchaikovsky, so I won't pretend to write a piece that actually sounds like him. I don't have his talent. But I can take inspiration from Tchaikovsky. You and me together, we can learn something about this type of symphony by writing our own movement. If you want to hear the completed movement, you can skip to the end of the video. In the meantime, in the next 20 minutes or so, I'll build up the movement theme by theme, segment by segment. For the next video after this one, I think I'll give you all four movements. No talking, no explanation, just the completed symphony, in case you'd like to hear it all together. I hope that, in addition to some insights into symphonies, I've also given you some nice music to enjoy. A movement should start with a theme. Let's call it Theme 1. No, let's call it Theme 1A, for reasons that will become clear. And let's listen to it before I talk too much about it. It goes on from there, continuing the same kind of thematic material. It's a dramatic opening to the movement, and it has a flavor of Tchaikovsky. First, although it's not a direct quote, it's kind of reminiscent of a phrase or two from his Pathétique Symphony. I keep telling you, borrowing is a time-honored method. John Williams' music from the Star Wars movies is filled with gestures and phrases that come straight from Tchaikovsky. Also, the orchestration that I used here is Tchaikovsky-ish. The winds are doing one thing, the strings are doing something entirely different, the timpani is doing its own thing, each component has its own distinctive contribution. Here's a small detail, but it's kind of cute. The melody line in the violins has two Gs, one after the other. Instead of having the first violins repeat the G, and the second violins play the harmony notes underneath, repeating the D, what I've done here is swap the first and second violins. They do a switcheroo. Here the first violins are on top, the seconds are underneath. Here the second violins are on top, hitting that G, and the firsts are underneath. Then they switch around again, and the firsts are on top. It probably doesn't make that much difference to the sound, but in theory it makes that repeated note stand out better. This is a famous Tchaikovsky trick, again straight out of the Pathétique Symphony. I'll point out one more little orchestration detail. The music dies down, you reach a quiet part, and something very weird happens. Look at the flute. It's playing the harmony notes underneath the oboe. Nobody does that. The flute is supposed to be on top. The oboes beneath the flute, the clarinet in the next register, and the bassoons on the bottom. What nut would use the flute for a bass line? Well, Tchaikovsky loves doing that. His scores are full of low flutes. In a quiet moment with thin orchestration, the low flute makes a beautiful, woody, smoky sound. So these are some of the ways I try to take inspiration from Tchaikovsky in this first theme. That and the intense romantic drama. But now I want to talk about overarching structure. What form should we choose for the last movement? A rondo, a theme in variations, those are very common, but my favorite is always the sonata form. In my view, the greatest architectural invention in music. It's a way to weave big contrasts and drama and suspense into a single movement. It treats music like a story, like a movie with a good plot. It's almost always used for first movements, and at least a third of the time it's used for last movements. The inner movements typically have a simpler dance form. 
So I'll use a sonata form here. Some people, including me, think that the form reached its pinnacle with Beethoven about a hundred years before Tchaikovsky. Let's talk very briefly about how a sonata form is organized. In the exposition, you introduce your characters. Theme one in the home key, theme two in a different key, and a closing theme to round out the segment. The themes contrast with each other to help give a greater emotional range to the movement. Then you have a development section that fragments and transforms the themes and takes you on a suspenseful journey through different keys and moods. Finally, in a burst of excitement, you get back home again. The recapitulation, theme one in the home key, theme two in the home key, and the closing theme to round everything out. Sometimes you add a coda to give the end a particular feel that you want. The peak of the drama, the structural keystone of the arch, so to speak, is this moment when the familiar first theme comes back again. You've gone on a journey through distant lands, and here is the satisfying moment when you step back through your familiar front door. This form was invented in the classical period. If you go back and look at my videos on how to compose a classical symphony, you'll see a very classical version of the sonata form. Beethoven is transitional between the classical and romantic period and brought the form to a kind of perfection. The famous Fifth Symphony, First Movement, is often considered to be one of the best examples ever written. By the time we reach the symphonies of Tchaikovsky, people are using the sonata form in a really different way. If you analyze the first movement of a Tchaikovsky symphony, you'll see the proportions are different from Beethoven's. There's a giant exposition that's almost like a movement in itself, sometimes eight minutes long, just for the exposition. And it doesn't just introduce the main themes, it develops them. Long passages will take the first theme and extend it, experiment with it. The drama will go up and down, and then you'll find yourself with a second theme which is also developed in an extended way. And when you get to the actual formal development section, it becomes kind of structurally superfluous. It's more like an interlude, and proportionally, it's a lot shorter. When you reach the end of the development and the recapitulation appears, that moment no longer feels like the climax of the piece. The journey through the development section is too short for that, and you've already gone through so many dramatic ups and downs, loud parts and quiet parts, that this moment doesn't feel uniquely or specially dramatic. In the classical sonata form, the recap is just a repeat of the exposition. The same themes are trotted out, like actors in a play coming out for a curtain call. But in a Tchaikovsky symphony, the recap is completely reimagined. The themes are handled in a grander way, sometimes even woven together or layered one on top of the other. Whatever you heard in the exposition is bigger and louder and more dramatic in the recap. The height of the drama has shifted closer to the end of the movement, especially to the second theme and the closing theme. So far we have only one theme, and we'll need a second one. Let me play you the second theme that I came up with. It has an unashamedly Russian flavor. that is so Russian. Having the clarinets take the theme, just the clarinets, is a very late romantic emphasis on color. You have your moments of big, blended orchestra, but you need moments where you hear the color of individual instruments. And of course, the color's always changing. Different instruments pick up the melody here, and then the upper strings pick up the tune here. But something is wrong here. Can you spot the problem? The first theme is in C minor, and the second theme is classically supposed to be in the relative major, E flat major. That gives you a maximum contrast between a dark minor key and a bright major key. But instead, this second theme is in another minor key, G minor, and that makes no sense. Even more bizarre, 
The whole symphony is supposed to be in G minor. You may remember from the previous videos, the first movement is in G minor. So how can the last movement start in the wrong key in C? What's going on here? Well, I'm breaking the rules. I'm trying to show you how you can loosen up the rules and be a little more creative and individualistic in the late Romantic period. The C minor first theme is acting like an introduction. It starts dramatically in the wrong place and slowly carries you to the right place. This new theme, which I'll call theme 1B, is the real principal theme of the movement. It's the most singable, catchy tune in the piece. We can build a sonata structure around this new theme as the primary one, even though it doesn't appear until three minutes into the music. Tchaikovsky wouldn't have done this. He tended to stick closely to the Western European traditions. In many ways, he was musically conservative, and the deep conflict between his Russian Eastern heritage and his Western European training has a lot to do with the power of his music. Maybe you've heard of the famous Russian Five, a handful of composers who try to forge a new way forward, a Russian style. The most famous are Borodin, Mussorgsky, and Rimsky-Korsakov. I had to look up Kui and Balakirov. They're much less well known. Well, Tchaikovsky was never part of that group. He was viewed as a bit of a sellout to the Western traditions, but it's exactly this tension between the Russian sensibilities and the Western structures that make his music special. It's fusion music. Here, like Tchaikovsky, I'll stick to the Western tradition, but I'm going to use a looser interpretation of the sonata form. I want to show you that late Romantic music can be more flexible. We have a theme 1A in C minor, theme 1B in G minor, and now we need a theme 2, preferably in a major key. Here's what I came up with. I was thinking of Tchaikovsky's famous Suite for Strings. I'm shamelessly taking inspiration from here and there and combining it into this Tchaikovsky-ish finale. However, as nice as this new theme is, this isn't a Suite for Strings, it's a symphony. So I don't think I want such a long passage with monochrome string writing. I think I need a counter melody woven in, maybe in the woodwinds, like this. Where theme 1A and 1B are dark minor key tunes, this theme 2 is joyful, even triumphant. It has good contrast with the previous material, and the contrast between themes is the deepest truth of a sonata movement. But, uh-oh, it's in the wrong key again. It's in E-flat major. Let's look at the diagram. We start with theme 1A in C minor. Traditionally, we'd then move to E-flat major, the relative major. So let's call this new one theme 2A. Theme 1A and theme 2A work nicely together in a traditional sonata movement. But they're kind of a fake out. They represent a shadow movement, a kind of misdirection. We also have theme 1B, the proper main theme in G minor and it needs a proper second theme in its relative major. We need a theme 2B in B-flat major. That way, theme 1A becomes an introduction flowing into theme 1B, and theme 2A becomes a part of the longer transition into theme 2B. This structure is like taking two normal sonata movements and mashing them together. It's complicated and weird, and as far as I know, unique. I've never seen a sonata movement written like this. Why on earth would I do something crazy like this? I did it for two reasons. First, I really just want to show you that you can play with the standard forms. Be creative, break the rules, or adapt them to the needs of the moment. By the late Romantic period, we should be able to break the rules. 
And second, my own deep inner inclinations are toward tearing up the rules. In my tutorials, I teach you all about rules and forms, but when no one's looking, when I'm writing for myself, I almost always avoid the rules and do it my way. If you ever go back and listen to my very early videos on this channel, you'll find my 7th, 8th, and 9th symphonies, and they're based on a total intentional lack of organization. Like when you're on a long road trip and you look out the window and scenery passes by, one thing flowing into the next, with no formal organization. I like that aesthetic. So here, in showing you a late romantic style of symphony, I'm taking the opportunity to loosen up the rules and try something crazy. And in the end, against all odds, I think it works aesthetically. Anyway, the unique structure of this movement calls for a theme in B-flat major, and here's the theme I came up with. <laughs> Very nice. I like this B-flat major theme. It has a kind of joyous quality. It's a good contrast to the minor key first theme. But if you think it's joyous here, wait till it comes back at the end of the piece. I created this theme specifically because I felt it could have two personalities. First, here in the exposition, it's uplifting, it sounds cheerful, but not overwhelming. When it comes back at the end in the recapitulation, I want to be able to reorchestrate it and make it triumphant, full of trumpets and drums to bring down the house. I experimented with different themes until I found one that could work in both of those ways. But we'll get to the trumpets and drums version later. We now have all the components of the exposition. All the themes have been presented. I've only played you a few excerpts so far, but the exposition weaves these themes together and to some extent develops them with dramatic ups and downs, spinning the tunes out for minutes at a time like a good late romantic exposition. Now we need a development section. Following the proportions of a Tchaikovsky symphony, my development section here is short, much shorter than the exposition. It's been de-emphasized. It's a bit of an interlude. It shows how fragments of melodies can leap from key to key before the music works its way back to the original themes. I'll play you an excerpt to give a sense of what I mean. You'll hear a sequence or a short segment of music that's repeated in a series of different keys. You'll also hear fragments of the main themes bouncing between different sections of the orchestra. The passage should give a feeling of constant motion. It's unsettled and moving like it's searching for something until it eventually finds its way back to the main themes. Now we're back to the first theme. The recapitulation proceeds just like the exposition. Theme 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, and a bit of a coda so we can finish off the whole symphony in the correct key of G minor. But I don't want the recap to be a cut and paste from the exposition. In a Tchaikovsky symphony, there's very little straight repetition. When themes come back again, he takes the opportunity to add something new or show them in a new light, and that approach is common in late Romantic symphonies. Here I made sure to treat the themes differently the second time around. That means adding a new bass line, changing the orchestration, or weaving in some other element. 
I won't go through all the examples, but I'll show you the theme that changes the most, theme 2B. Here it is in its quieter form from the exposition. And here it is in its triumphant form at the climatic end of the movement. That's rousing. Notice the very simple orchestration. The loud stuff involves the two trumpets, doubled by the first and second horns, and tripled by the third and fourth horns. That's the mightiest shout you can get out of this brass section, along with the trombones crashing away at the bottom. I think I've talked enough about how this movement was constructed. It's my attempt to improve my own understanding of late romantic music, but as always, more than anything else, it's my attempt to teach you some of those lessons. Here's the whole movement, the finale of the tutorial symphony in four romantic styles. 